Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people that I've connected with over the years in the music business. And today, it is my great pleasure and honor to have on the show Canada's country gentleman, Mr. Tommy Hunter. Now, full disclosure, we have never met. However, I feel like you are a part of my family and millions of other Canadians as you were a regular visitor to our living rooms for over 30 years. Welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and it's a pleasure to talk to you and your many uh, listeners and viewers, and thank you for those nice compliments. Well, well well-deserved. The name Country Gentleman was well-earned. I know that you started out really early in the, in the, the business, uh, you had a, your first professional gig as a rhythm guitarist and singer on the CBC show Country Hoedown when you were just 19 years old. That's correct, yeah. And I enjoyed that show very much. It was on for nine wonderful years. And with a, very, with a lot of very talented people, people may forget that one of our background singers was a, a great guy and a good singer and a fine songwriter. His name is Gordon Lightfoot. He was uh, one of our background singers. That's uh, that's really interesting. And I know that you were instrumental in launching a lot of other people's careers that we can talk about as we go as well. Uh, now, from what I understand, the Tommy Hunter Show started on the CBC radio and it ran for a few years on radio before hitting the CBC TV uh, yes, yeah, it was a, I mean, it was a totally different uh, show. It was, you know, the radio show was done as a radio show at the old McGill Street studio where the original Happy Gang uh, used to broadcast for years and years. So uh, we always had a live audience and that was always interesting because some days the audience wasn't completely, or the auditorium wasn't completely filled. <laughs> and every once in a while, you could hear a wine bottle come rolling down and hit the front of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Now, I understand that you uh, started recording professionally in the studio way back in the late 50s. And boy, oh boy, that uh, that took some talent. Well, I was never, uh, I just thought that recording was part of your career, but I was never what you would call a successful recording artist, I I guess. Many thanks to the fans. They bought uh, some of my recordings, but as far as making it into the top 10 charts or Billboard or Cashbox or Record World, uh, about the closest I ever came to that was a song called Mary in the Morning. And I think that made it to 22 or 24 or something on the charts. But uh, that was it. And that was quite an achievement back in those days. It was really hard for Canadian artists to get on the radio. Yes, yeah. It was was very hard to even uh, get any kind of chart action. I mean, Billboard or Cashbox or Record World, you know, they just, they weren't interested in reviewing somebody that, had a limited market in Canada, unless your your records were being sold in the United States. And I was very fortunate. My contract with Columbia Records was an American contract. So uh, my records were being distributed in the United States as well as Canada. Right. So that was a stroke of good luck there. Well, I... it, it wasn't really a stroke of good luck. It was Saul Holliff who managed me here in Canada and also managed Johnny Cash worldwide. And so uh, when I got on Columbia, you remember that Johnny Cash was on Columbia. So there was a little bit of influence, uh, an awful lot of influence from Johnny Cash and Saul Olive. Right. Well, probably I should qualify that rather than a stroke of luck. I mean, you make your luck when you line yourself with the right people and, and do all the right things and put in the work. Well, I think, and that's, that's true of, of anybody in the business world. You know, you're, they always say you're always judged by who you, who you hang around with. But I was very fortunate. I had good people. It was Jim Reeves. Remember? A great country singer. It was Jim who 
came to me one day and said, you know, Saul Holoff wants to manage you in the worst way. And I said, I don't need a manager. I'm, I can look after everything pretty well myself. And he said, no, you, sh you really should consider it. So I thought it over and, uh, and I eventually went with Saul Holoff and uh, it, was a, it was a good decision. Absolutely. Now, we all know about the Tommy Hunter show. There were a couple of other contemporary shows that featured primarily country music back in the day, but I think what set the Tommy Hunter show apart was that you tried to give country music some dignity and class that you didn't see on other shows like Hee Haw, for example. Hmm. I, yeah, one of the things that I didn't lay down many rules when I signed the contract or with the producer or something, I, I had run-ins with, with producers, but the one thing I didn't want was uh, bales of hay and uh, cattle lowing in the background. Uh, I thought that was a little bit too insulting to, to the people that liked country music. I didn't want it to always be associated with the barnyard. So I didn't want hay or cattle anywhere on the set. Right. We did have hay sometimes, and I managed to, to get rid of it about 99% of the time. <laughs> Creative control, just done by doing, right. Yeah, so I understand that the show was based in Toronto, but you quite often took the show on the road and played at different communities uh, across the country. So that, I think, added a, a bit more of a personal feel. Yeah, the the um, to take the entire television show on the road was a very difficult move because that meant you needed not only the musicians and the singers and the camera and, and uh, but you needed the entire technical staff to go with you and you know if you're going into an arena it has to be all set up where the cameras are going to be and the lighting and all of that so. We did do some remote shows, television shows, but the shows that I did were mainly when I was on tour with my band and myself. Those are the uh, the ones that I think most people refer to as, you know, I saw you when you were on tour or you came to our particular town. And uh, one of the greatest compliments that I always thought was very complimentary was when people would come over at the end of the show, I would always sit down on a chair and, and sign autographs and shake hands and talk to people. And many of them would say, I sure enjoyed your show tonight. It was just like watching the television show. And I always thought that was the greatest because uh, I only had a five piece band on stage and me. And that was it. There was no, television cameras and no lighting or no nothing. It was just, it was just bare bones. But the fact that they thought it reminded them of the television show was a wonderful compliment. And things were so much different back in those days. I mean, nowadays when you produce a show, I mean, you can edit, you know, if you get something wrong that can be fixed. I mean, you go into the recording studio, you can take 12 takes to get one line if you need to. And back when you were active, you had to get it right, and you had to get it right every single time. Yeah, that was true. We didn't like editing. I didn't even know what editing was. Well, I did know, but I didn't like doing it. But, you know, if you did make a mistake, you were far better just to say, look, it, hold it, let's go right back to the top and start over again. And sometimes it worked better that way. But the odd time we did edit, but uh, not very often. Right, yeah. You know, I not that long ago, I watched an interview with uh, Roy Clark, and he talked about doing live TV and how frustrating it was for him because they were. he said, you know, we were playing Gibson guitars and we were under these hot lights and they were always out of tune. You know, so it was a different time, that's for sure. Yeah, it was... There were always little technicalities that would enter into... Uh, into doing the television show if you came in early in the morning and it was it was cool outside your guitar was cold 
and you would take your guitar out and, and tune it and put it on the uh, music stand. By the time you went to play, it was all of the tune again because the the heat from the lights changed the tonality and the tuning of the of the guitar slightly. So you always had to retune it again. Right. Well, as I mentioned uh, when we spoke uh, a few days ago about doing this interview, I learned how to play guitar basically by playing along with the Ed Sullivan Show and the Tommy Hunter Show. And you would never have known from your show that there were any tuning problems or, or anything like that. It was always so tight and professional. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's that's a, a, a nice compliment to the producers and directors uh, of, of the show. And I, uh, I, I will pass that all along to them. Well, that's very kind of you. Yeah. No, I had the... You know, it, when we were talking about that, I was very fortunate to uh, have what I felt were the best producers, directors, cameramen, writers that any television show could have. And that basically is the reason for the success of the show, because they were all good. It's all those little ingredients that, uh, that make a show successful. Right. And speaking of the show, you had some incredible guests on that show. Who booked the talent? Did you have anything to do with that, or was it producers that took care of the, the booking? Um, it was a combination of both. Mainly the producer or one of his assistants would be in contact with the agency or the artist directly, but they would always run it by me first. And say we're uh, here's some of the guests that we're getting in touch with. Do you have any problems with this? And I go through the list and said no, that's fine. They're all good. And we always had, you know, the guests enjoyed doing the show. And then when our show was picked up by uh, the American Network, then the artist had a chance to see the show, and they realized that it was a it was a good show, and I say good not from my perspective, but well produced, well written, you know, so it wasn't a cornball show that was put together in a haphazard way. There was a lot of thought and professionalism that went into the show, and I think that the artists that did the show had seen it, and many of them wanted to do the show, and many of their agents used to call us. We never... Well, we did call some, but most of the agents called us, particularly if they, if if an artist was going to tour Canada, they'd say, yeah, they would tell them, don't tour Canada unless you do the Hunter show. Right. Well, it certainly was a well-oiled machine. Now, without mentioning any names, was there ever anybody that wanted to be on the show that you did not want on there? No. No, no I never... Uh, I never stopped anybody from doing the show. No. Okay, great. No, if, uh, you know, there were, there were uh, you know, there were artists that I was, I was absolutely adamant about having on the show that I wanted on the show in the worst way. And naturally, one of them was Roy Acuff because I saw him when I was nine years of age. He was my inspiration. And to have him on my show was a great, a great thrill. And I remember introducing him and walking uh, away and letting him perform. And uh, I walked to the side of the stage and cried like a baby. Yeah, it was, uh, it was such a big thrill, you know, uh, from a kid sitting in the audience at nine years of age in total awe of this man. And then to look at this same individual being featured on my own television show was uh, was overwhelming. These magic yeah. moments. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel right now, to be honest. Yeah. Nothing like talking with one of your idols. So I know that there were an awful lot of people that, you helped launch the careers of, and one was a young 14-year-old girl from Timmins, Ontario, who went by the name Eileen Twain. <laughs> That's right. 
Shania Twain. Yeah, she was a. Even back then, she was a great, a great singer, and it was a pleasure to have her on the show, and she deserved to be on the show. No doubt. And I mean, there were people like Garth Brooks, the Judds, Alanis Morissette. Now that's that's an interesting guest to be on the Tommy Hunter show. But I understand that she was in in country music at that time. You had Anne Murray. I, I think I, I remember. Did she sing Snowbird? Did she debut that song on your show? Yeah. I I don't know whether she debuted it, but I know she sang that song on the show. Yeah. Good song. Gene McClellan wrote that. There's a name for you. A uh, very nice guy and a good singer and uh, lived in the Maritimes. And, uh, and he wrote Snowbird. Also wrote Put Your Hand in the Hand of the Man. Yes. Yes. Both huge, huge hits. Nice guy, by the way. Just a very soft-spoken, down-to-earth individual. Right. Now, I know you were inducted into the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame. You were made a member of the Order of Canada. You've won multiple Juno Awards, Gemini's, the Order of Ontario. There's a street in London, Ontario, named after you, Tommy Hunter Way. Yes, (laughs) That was a great, uh, a great thrill. I wasn't there when it opened, but I was there many times after that. I don't think our tour bus, when it was on its way going through London or stopping in London, I always took the bus out Hamilton Road, down St. Julian Street, and uh, made all the guys, and I, we turned the corner, and there was the sign. Tommy had her way, and I said to the guys, I want you to look up here, and they were all half asleep, and they'd open up and oh, yeah, Tommy had her way. Isn't that great? Boom, back asleep again. <laughs> um, so the bus driver knew if we were going out Hamilton Road or we were coming from up north somewhere, and we were going to be going through London and uh, pick up Highbury Avenue and take us to the 401, that, that we were going to make a, a turn and head down towards Tommy Hutter Way. Yeah, that was a big thrill. Okay. That was in an area, by the way, where I used to play as a kid. We lived on Brisbane Street in London, and uh, so if you went right down the end of Brisbane Street, there was a hill, and you could ride a lot of these hills over to St. Julian Street, and it linked right up with what is now Tommy Hunter Way. Well, that's awesome. That is awesome. Now, I know that you also, in recent years, you were inducted into the London Music Hall of Fame here in London, Ontario. I think they call it the Forest City London Music Hall of Fame. Yes, yeah. You know, to be to be recognized for, you know, so-called achievements is very flattering and, uh, and quite an honor. And... Uh, Particularly when you're, you know, when your hometown recognizes you, and that's a, a, a real thrill. And you've had double honors here, among other things. So, quite the long and illustrious career you've had. And as I said, there were millions of us that tuned in every week to watch your show. And I, I don't know where we would have been without the Tommy Hunter show, to be honest. Well, thank you. You know, I was. <laughs> I don't want this to sound uh, egotistical or, or anything, but I was always very much aware of the audience and very respectful of the audience that tuned us in every single week. And that's why if I had any run in with producers or writers, it was always something over the fact that I did not want that to be seen on television, or I didn't want that to be said on television. So uh, I would either go to the writer and say, that's not, I don't want that that idea in the show. I, I think it's very in, inappropriate and, and it's unnecessary. And sometimes they would argue, and uh, <laughs> when it, it came right down to the bottom line, I'd, I'd listen to all their arguments and everything else, and I'd say, well, uh, I'm not going to stand here and argue this point any further. We've discussed it as 
well, if I can express my viewpoints with you, and you're still adamant about it going into the show, but there's a little clause that I happen to have in my contract, and I want you to go back to the office, get the producer to show you, and there's a line in there that says that I have total artistic control. So now I'm exercising my artistic control. That is not going in the show. So that was, and that happened on very rare occasions, but there were times when a, a writer or somebody was very adamant that it was going in the show. And, uh, and I, I just felt that it wasn't too, I, I just felt that the, the audience would rebel if they, uh, if they saw that or heard that. So uh, that was it. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's rare even today. Most artists don't have creative control over what they do. And it's something that I, I talked to a lot of, of artists who were somebody and now they're driving a school bus or they're, you know, working a day job doing something else because they just didn't have the business acumen and they, you know, yeah. didn't have that sense. And I think it's a big, big win when somebody like yourself can actually exercise some business acumen and, and use creative control in your favor. Well, thank you. You know, sometimes people forget that an individual could walk over and put out his hand and say, hi, I'm your producer. And I don't know, is, is he good or is he average? Or, uh, so you, you really have to do a lot of checking and ask an awful lot of questions from various people that may have worked with him or her. And just to, to get some information and to get to a point where you feel comfortable. You know, and when you get to that feeling, as I did with uh, probably the best producer and director I ever worked with, Les Pouliot was the producer. Joan Tassoni was the director. They were two of the best people you could work with in the industry. They knew the music. They enjoyed the music. They, uh, they, we all got along great together. And they knew what was good for me and what wasn't good for me. So it was a good working relationship, and and I had fun. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit, there was no, there was no arguing. There was never any fighting or anything. I just let them do their job, and I did my job. And that's when you know it's working good. Absolutely, and you had a well-oiled machine behind oh, you. Oh, I sure did. Yeah. yeah, I had the best. Yeah, it. You know, it's hard for people to understand that the success of the show is based upon the people you surround yourself with. As I said earlier in the conversation, I had the very best, the best writer, the best producer, um, the best cameraman. I had the cream of the crop. So there was only really one person. <laughs> if, if anybody was going to fail, it was me, because I had the best of everybody surrounding me. So... Uh, you know, hope, hopefully I did uh, I did my part and they, they did theirs and that's what made it go. Right. You know, that's, that's sage advice too. I had somebody a number of years ago tell me, and we all, not all, but a lot of us musical artists make the mistake of working with our friends and putting friendship above the business. And somebody out of Montreal a number of years ago said to me, listen, you've got something you got something good, but you have to surround yourself with the best possible people. And I took that advice to heart. Now, the music industry has changed tremendously, but I've never had more fun than I have had over the number of years that I've worked with the professional artists that I needed to be working with. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice compliment. And, and let me, can I just add something further? When you work with professional people... It's funny how your standard comes up much higher because you can do things. You can express yourself to a musician and say, uh, really, I'd like to do this. Let's change the tempo and let's do this. And they say, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, what about if I did this and did that? And you're all, all of a sudden, you're now at a nice level and everybody's putting their... Uh, professional input into the arrangement or the song or 
uh, changing something to make it much, uh, much, much better. Absolutely. I mean, you can't jump off a third floor balcony without a safety net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you could, but might not be your best decision. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to read about the results. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, over, over the years, you released 12 albums, and the show was on the air for 36 years. That's quite, quite the, the achievement. And breaking through onto the Nashville network, all the things that you've, the accolades that you've, you've been able to celebrate. Wow. What a career you've had. And uh, you're still pretty active. I mean, I, I know you're not in the music business anymore, but when I called you the other day, you said, listen, I'm working on something in my living room. And most people who are of your age demographic would be saying, well, listen, let me get my person to wheel me over somewhere and, and uh, uh, you still have an active body and an active mind and that's to be celebrated well thank you one thing you haven't discussed is my age and I'll, I'll reveal that I'm 83 years of age I was born in March the 20th 1937 and I've been blessed you know from the the success of, uh, of very successes that I've had in the music business and, uh, and a very loyal group of fans. So it's, uh, you know, I've been blessed in many, many ways. So um, it's gratifying. I guess that's why I, I'm always very respectful when I was doing the television show of that audience uh, because they were, they were fans that enjoyed what I did and supported the show. So uh, I was always on guard looking out for them too. Well, I'll tell you, there's a couple of things that I don't like to talk about on my podcast, and they are religion and politics. Having said that, I know that one of the things that spurred you on over the years is your faith. And I think yeah. one of the things that was uh, evident in your show's professionalism was that you wanted to provide for Canadians good, clean fun and entertainment. Exactly. I I mean, there were there were parameters that that you grow up with as a child. My parents were, you know, they they went to church. They they raised me. The you know, and spent a lot of time with me, and and uh, um, I had a very good childhood, a very happy childhood. And I was an only child, and <laughs> I I don't think they uh, they spoiled me. Probably they did, but. Uh, you know, I was, I had a very happy upbringing, a very happy childhood and no, no bad memories or anything. And I think all of that plays into the character of the television show. You're not carrying around a bunch of loose baggage uh, with you, you know, when people bring up a subject or something, it's, uh, you know, what about your childhood? It was always a very happy childhood. Right, you were raised with respect and taught to to be respectful. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you sure were. Yeah, well, you know, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Tommy. But what I like to do is to let my guests have the final word on the show. So, if there is anything that you particularly want to say to the people, have at it. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, as I've said a couple of times during the conversation. The success of the show was not only based upon having very talented people surrounding you, but it was the fact that the audience tuned in every single week. And so if the audience wasn't there, uh, it wouldn't be very long and I wouldn't be there. But I'm, I'm, uh, uh, it gives me an opportunity now to say thank you to, uh, to the many viewers that tuned in to our television show, to our radio show that came out to see us in personal appearances and bought our records. I really appreciate it. And to them, I say a very sincere thank you. And behalf of millions of your fans, I say thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. And, and I've enjoyed this. And thank you very much for the time. Well, thank you. Well, what a treat for me that was, interviewing Tommy Hunter. As I said earlier in the podcast, he was a welcome guest in the family room on Friday nights on CBC TV for so many of us boomers. Now, without further ado, here is Tommy Hunter and Travelin' Man. Please enjoy. 
Traveling man, following the breeze. Traveling here, traveling there, gathering memories. So let me wander, wander. Let me wander all my life away. Just a traveling on my way. That a traveling man walks a lonely mile But I find friends along my way Who offer me a smile So let me wander, wander Let me wander all my life away Just a traveling on my way Just traveling on my way Just one man for company, my dear Lord by my side. So let me wander, let me wander all my life away. Just a traveling on my way, just traveling on my way, just a traveling. Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including research, guest acquisition, etc. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends was written, recorded by Tommy Solo with a little help from my friends in the night crew, all rights reserved. And hey, if you like the podcast, why don't you subscribe at Google, Apple Music, etc. Until next time, cheers.